Good morning and welcome to Policy Perspectives hosted by the Alliance to Save Energy. My name is Paula Glover and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Alliance. And today we're honored to have with us Congressman Peter Welch representing the great state of Vermont. Congressman Welch is known as a leader in energy efficiency, a major proponent of broadband access in addition to investing in infrastructure. All priorities as you know that are directly connected to what's occurring in Washington today. So I'd suggest perhaps Congressman just a tad bit busy. Importantly, Congressman Welch sits on the Committee on Energy and Commerce, um, in addition to Oversight and Reform, the Select Committee on Intelligence, and the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. Today, we're gonna discuss the Main Street Efficiency Act, a piece of legislation sponsored by Congressman Welch in the House and Senator Catherine Cortez Masto in the Senate. Congressman Welch has been with the Alliance from the very beginning in the development of the Main Street Efficiency Act, and the Alliance really appreciates his leadership, his support, and, and his support in getting this important piece of legislation introduced, and for his support and working diligently towards its passage, including possible inclusion in budget reconciliation. To set a little context, we all know that coming out of this pandemic, or at least through this last year and a half, um, things have been really tough on Main Street and our small businesses. And the Main Street Efficiency Act is just that, right? A piece of legislation is there. Our businesses, this legislation provides direct grants from the department to utilities um, for the purpose of offsetting small business related efficiency investments. Um, many utilities operate demand side management programs that particularly cover these costs, but small business owners are still left to make up the difference. They partially cover the cost, excuse me. Main Street matches the utility share up to 50%, allowing small businesses to achieve facility and building retrofits at low or no cost. Following our discussion with Congressman Welch, we'll be joined by Adam Procell, who is a board member of the Alliance to Save Energy and serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of Wilden. Um, Wilden recently purchased a NASDAQ listed company that Adam founded, Lime Energy, um, which is a leader, which was a leader in energy efficiency programs for small and medium sized businesses. And I can tell you all um, that something also that's really pretty special about Main Street is its focus on diverse businesses, which is something that Adam has been an advocate and a ch champion for his entire career. Adam is going to lead a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Pat Watts, CEO of FCI Management. Um, FCI leads in the development and implementation of energy and water efficiency solutions for corporate, residential, commercial, industrial clients. Um, Adam and Pat are going to discuss how small business energy efficiency investments work on the ground and why the Main Street Efficiency Act is needed and how the legislation is going to assist in incentivizing small businesses to participate in utility energy efficiency programs. So with that, we're going to start with Congressman Peter Welch. Congressman, thank you so much for your leadership and for taking the time to join us today. Um, and I want to turn the floor over to you um, to make some comments. Um, Paula, thank you. I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing. It, it, it's great to be your partner, and I'm really thrilled to be here uh, with Pam um, and Adam. You know, the Main Street uh, Efficiency Act uh, obviously is about two things. Number one, uh, it's an acknowledgement that uh, we all have to do our part in order to reduce carbon emissions. And uh, I'm not going to preach to the converted here about the absolute existential urgency of doing that. But number two, uh, and this is what I think makes this so powerful, it is working with our partners, people who have businesses and utilities whose job it is to provide power to those businesses uh, to help business do what they want to do, and that is to reduce their carbon emissions, to save on their energy bill, uh, and to provide a better service uh, to uh, their customers. And I'm going to give an example of that down the road. But we're in a new place now um, on this whole debate about climate. Uh, I, I, you know, a few years ago, there was a debate about whether it was real. Uh, I mean, those days are long gone. And if we're going to be successful in addressing it, we actually have to come up with practical ways to make it possible, in this case, for our smaller businesses to be able to do this 
uh, you know, continue to pay their bills and to serve their customers. So there's got to be a practical approach to allowing us to achieve the reduction in carbon emissions that we all know we need. And if we're going to be successful ultimately in bringing down our carbon emissions and eliminating them, it's an all hands on deck situation where everybody has to be given the opportunity to participate and make a contribution. So the Main Street Fairness Act is understanding that businesses want to do it. And it's also understanding that businesses have existing challenges that have to be faced and we can't simply pass the full cost of going to zero emissions onto them and say, you do it. There's gotta be a partnership and that partnership has to be in this case with Main Street efficiency between a federal policy, the federal government uh, that creates a policy uh, that assists our utilities and our utilities are essential in the delivery of power uh, to our homes and our businesses. And then our businesses that wanna take advantage of opportunities that that public policy and that utility are gonna be able to provide to do practical things for their particular business in that business's particular location and what uh, the opportunities are uh, for reducing carbon emissions and lowering a utility bill. So. As, as uh, Paula was saying, the bill is pretty simple. It would provide $6 billion uh, in grants that would go through utilities that have programs to partner with their businesses. And I'll just give a really concrete example. Uh, we have a business, a small business in Bennington, Vermont, the public house. Um, and uh, it had a really big, um, it had a really big energy bill. And not only that, it was a pretty drafty place where people would you know, have a beer and have a burger, but it was quite popular. Uh, well, Energy Efficiency Vermont partnered and uh, with the public house and created a much more energy efficient uh, uh, st a, a building by doing the particular things that needed to be done in that building, which may well be different than the particular things that uh, another business would have to do in its building. And the result is that there has been a $12,000 annual savings in the bill, or pardon me, in their energy bill. Number two, significant reduction, about 60,000 pounds, carbon emissions reduced. Um, and they've got more customers because, um, you know, we want our burger and beer in kind of a warm and cozy uh, place. And it's worked out all around. And as we also know, uh, in addition to the fact that there's savings uh, for the public house, uh, there's reduction in carbon emissions. The work that was done was by local tradespeople in Bennington. And we're gonna create thousands and thousands of jobs with this uh, program. And of course, uh, so you, you get the benefit of better paying and more jobs. You get the benefit of carbon reduction uh, in our emissions and you get energy savings. All of that happens as a result of this partnership that we're wanting to stand up with the Main Street Efficiency Act. And it's been an area where on efficiency, there's, there has been bipartisan cooperation on this because whatever your argument is about the power source, if you can use less of it, you're gonna save money and you're gonna reduce carbon emissions. And it, the work has to be done locally and it creates that potential for significant uh, job uh, gains uh, in, in, in your community where you live. So it, it, the steps that we've taken here in Vermont with our energy efficiency utility, where we've had a program like this in place for some time, have really proven their benefit. This public policy would create that opportunity all around the country. And the other thing, we've got some folks uh, on, uh, uh, this uh, this call that could probably speak to this better, but my experience here in Vermont is our businesses uh, are really, really eager to become more efficient. And yes, they've got a bottom line orientation. It'll save us money, but there's an increasing uh, sense of urgency among consumers that the businesses that they deal with have a commitment to 
protecting our climate. That is a sales point. And, uh, but how do you make that happen? How do you take the desire that uh, individual citizens have that they'd like to patronize a business that is doing its part to help us address climate issues uh, without bankrupting the business and imposing the full burden of the expense for transition onto them? The Main Street Efficiency Act is a way in which we can do that. So, you know, amidst all the conflict we have in Washington, uh, whether you're a business in a district that was votes uh, supported pres former President Trump or current President Biden, it's good for your business, it's good for the environment. And it's one of the aspects of this that I find very appealing. We're talking about solving a problem and doing it in a way that creates that partnership that you need between a smart public policy that has to come out of Washington, the utilization of our utilities that have a strong and immediate connection with their customers and our local businesses that are rooted in the community that they serve. So we're not trying to create something new out of whole cloth. We're taking existing structures. We're taking the commitments and the professionalism of the people uh, in the utilities and the professionalism uh, in the practical wisdom of the people who run these businesses and finding a way with public policy where we can provide that financial incentive uh, that makes the, uh, the ideal possible to actually implement. So I'm very excited to be working with my Senate uh, partner on this, uh, Senator Cortez Masto, uh, and with my partners in the, in the House. Uh, and obviously we're gonna be doing everything we can to try to have this included in the reconciliation bill. Uh, that's one option. And that obviously is a train that we hope will leave the station. Lots of battles along the way there. But um, we're gonna be continuing to pursue this uh, and ultimately I believe we'll be successful because you know what? It actually makes sense to do. And as I said at the beginning, it makes sense to do regardless of what your political orientation is. Save money, reduce carbon emissions, create jobs. That kind of works for everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Paula. Thank you so much, Congressman, and thank you for um, really highlighting the importance of this bill, business supporting business, right? Um, one response, an important response to us dealing with climate change as well as job creation. And look, we're, we're still in the middle of an economic recovery. I wondered if you have some time to take a few questions. I know your are sure. is really tight. Um, so I'm going to ask attendees, if you have a question for the congressman, to please put it in the chat, which would be right, not to chat, Q&A box right below you. Please put your questions in Q&A right below you. I'm going to start um, with one quick question before other questions come in, and we'll see how many we can get to before you have to go. That works. Um, so, Congressman, as you mentioned, right, this bill already has really great support in your committee, broad committee support, um, as, well, as well as support from members who aren't really on the Energy and Commerce Committee, but still is supporting a lot of this bill. I wanted just to find out, like, what more should we be doing and can we be doing at the Alliance um, and within our energy efficiency community to um, support and champion Main Street um, so that it is passed? Well, you guys have been doing a good job. I mean, with, what I found is powerful about you is that you represent jobs. And every one of my colleagues, uh, Republican, Democrat, liberal or conservative, pays attention when people from their district come in and say, we want policy A or B, because that's gonna help us create jobs in your district. That really speaks to members of Congress of both parties. So I think that, first of all, you've been doing a lot, Paula, and I really appreciate it. You've been persistent. And uh, you've got to have uh, uh, you've got to have a lot of resilience to be advocating public policy um, in uh, the 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 uh, the cauldron of Washington. But keep it up, and that local connection in that reference to jobs that are being created in the members district, where the business that's speaking to that member is from the district, that's very very compelling. So keep it up. That's what you need to do. Keep doing it. Awesome. Well, we have some questions. So I'm going to start um, with um, one that says, does this act focus on developing efficient neighborhoods through integrated action or by mostly targeting individual buildings and business? 
Um, the former gives greater economic and climate gains, but requires more policy subtlety. Well, you know what, that's true. Um, it, it does create policy su subtlety and it creates implementation uh, challenges. Uh, so I think it's ultimately preferable, um, but the, uh, the bill does do the latter much more in the sense that I'm, I'm gonna take Vermont where we've had a long tradition of an energy efficiency utility. You know, we, we, we created in Vermont a, a, a new utility that was uh, intended to uh, promote efficiency and it's worked out really, really well. But it has been a business by business approach as opposed to a community approach. But what it has also done is have a policy that's focused on demand side management, which by definition, keeps the dollars in that local community wherever that project has occurred. So the overall concept that is embedded in that question makes some, a lot of sense to me. How do you implement it on a practical level? Uh, without, uh, and I don't have the answer to that, but that's, I think, a significant challenge. But where the policy is basically about helping that business in that local community, where the policy has embedded in it, in effect, demand side management, the prospects for keeping the benefits, the economic benefits in that community, um, uh, I think is significantly enhanced. But I would uh, uh, welcome the, the person who asked that question to uh, give me some suggested answers uh, because I really like uh, the direction of it. Sure. So uh, whoever asked the question, Peter, um, he, and his response was he's happy to give you some suggestions. So thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. you should, uh, here. Thank you. Our question is a little bit about this. Um, it's a biggie. Um, do you see any challenges in getting the support to fund this, this bill? Um, you mentioned that it's a $6 billion um, budget line item, um, and, but with Congress kind of having to look at the debt ceiling debate pretty soon, um, what are their challenges, if there are any, in kind of getting full funding, partial funding, or any funding for it? Well, first of all, there's always a challenge in funding, uh, you know, obviously. And in fact, it, the, the fact that it does have a price tag is a reason why uh, many of my Republican colleagues who've been supportive on other efficiency measures aren't on this. But there's a reason why we wanna to try to get this into the reconciliation bill where uh, there's gonna be significant funding for climate initiatives. There's also, I think, a growing recognition that we are gonna to have to invest in climate initiatives in order to achieve our goal um, of uh, reducing carbon emissions and saving the planet. And what we've seen with efficiency measures is that when you create, you take into account the savings for the businesses and the jobs that are created, uh, that doesn't happen without some public investment. So we've got to make the case, but I think the case is compelling. Thank you so much. Next question from Ms. Nancy Seedman. Um, are there any job training aspects to this bill um, so that we can ensure we have people available and trained for the work. Um, and then the secondary question is, how do we ensure that we have a diverse workforce? And I know um, Congressman Rush has the Blue Collar, the Green Collar Act, um, but are there any other bills or opportunities that we should be thinking about in terms of job training um, so that once this bill passes and we're gonna put it um, in the universe that we're gonna see success, we have the workforce we need? Well, that is, as the questioner mentioned, Congressman Rush has been the leader on this, and he's been persistent uh, and persuasive. So the job training that we absolutely have to have and building up of neighborhoods uh, and neighborhood workforces that we have to have, I think is really essential, but that's not going to be the major thrust of this bill. That will come from, I think, two other things. One is Congressman Rush's initiatives uh, that I strongly support. And then secondly, as you know, uh, we're talking about uh, creating a civilian uh, climate conservation corps, uh, thousands of young people that would be in neighborhoods. And that's part of the Biden initiative. So I think this training uh, point that's being made by this questioner is absolutely essential. Uh, and there, it, it won't be the primary thrust of this legislation, but it's got to be a primary goal of the administration that I support. Right. Um, our next question, Congressman, um, from Mr. John Hill. Um, is there any chance um, that we could expand this type of support for energy efficiency to residential buildings? 
Well, yes. Uh, and in fact, the Hope for Homes legislation that I am co-sponsoring with my Republican counterpart, David McKinley, would do this. It would create incentives for homeowners to essentially do these energy efficiency measures in their homes. So yes, and we've got to do that. We do it here in Vermont. Okay. So those of you who are not following Hope for Homes, I encourage you to follow um, along on Hope. what's happening with Hope for Homes and maybe even call, call your own congressman if it's of interest to you. Um, great. A um, next question um, is this. Um, would the act help to enable electric vehicles and storage to work with buildings um, efficiency and assist resiliency of the grid? You know, I don't know that if it, 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 there's a lot of flexibility in this and how you would save the energy. So that's not part of what's contemplated here. But if a local utility was able to partner with some business to do that, it might be within the realm of possibility, but that's not the heart of this bill. Okay. Um, and then our final question, unless oh, I, but we have two more, so, and then I will let you go, Congressman. Um, our next question is from Tanuj Diora. Um, can you share when you expect the House reconciliation language to be released? Um, and will this be part of that language or will it be in the Senate version? Can you read those? Um, well, the Energy and Commerce Committee meeting is going to be meeting on, on Monday. So we're going to have a lot of information on reconciliation by Monday. Uh, second, my hope is that we would include this in the House version. So it's all to be determined. But my goal is Monday <laughs> in the House version. But I'm making no promises on that. As you know, this is kind of a wild process that none of us have been through before. Yeah, sure. And our final question is from Mr. Stan Colby. Um, and he starts by saying, we're thankful that the bill um, helps small businesses boost efficiency and indoor air quality by upgrading or installing modern ventilation and filtration. Um, what can we do to increase awareness of how this bill helps battle airborne pathogens um, as well as the current and future pandemics? Well, Stan has been an advocate on this uh, forever. Stan, thank you for all that you do. And just keep being Stan. I mean, you get the news out better than most of us. Uh, and I think that uh, there's an awareness, but it's got to be expanded about the existential threat that climate change is in all kinds of ways. And of course, uh, when we're using fossil-based fuels, uh, they're obviously uh, have health consequences beyond the climate change, beyond the floods and the fires that we're seeing into uh, uh, the health and well-being of citizens versus the wind and solar. So Stan, just keep being Stan. You're doing a good job. Okay, thank you. Um, so Congressman, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna steal one more question out of you. And I promise this is it. Um, you know, you're known for your leadership in energy efficiency, but you're also really known for effectively working across the aisle um, and identifying common sense approaches to everyday concerns. And um, in this day and age, it seems like someone with your skill set is rare, although I don't think so. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, as we look at energy efficiency, um, because the value of it is so substantive um, and that it's a leader in carbon reduction, as you mentioned, um, it reduces energy consumption. Um, it also then reduces the need for ever-growing capacity. Um, it reduces energy burden. It has the potential to reduce energy insecurity. Um, what do you envision or what would you propose as key comprehensive federal energy efficiency legislation that you think could be included and supported by both sides? Well, there's, first of all, what you just laid out, Paula, is why it makes sense for both sides to want to get to yes on, on energy efficiency. You know, it helps any community. It can be the reddest the red or the bluest the blue. If they're creating jobs, they're reducing carbon emissions, uh, they're creating a safer planet and lower cost for their businesses. That's a good thing. So that's the argument I'm making. It's not an ideological argument. It's like, hey, this is good for you. It's good for me. You know, uh, vote who you want to vote for. But you know what? Do something that's good for the people you represent. So that's the case I'm trying to make. It's tough in this, you know, tribal political atmosphere we have. But I think the key, and this is one of the reasons I work so much on energy efficiency, is that it's a case I can make regardless of political ideology. And when we get back to dealing with concrete solutions to problems that all of the people we represent face, our prospects for unity on other things increases. So you summarized it very well. 
Oh, thank you. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for your time. I know um, you have a busy day ahead and you said Monday. So, um, yep. you know, today is <laughs> Thursday. Uh, so we're going to we're going to let you go. Um, we understand that this is a sprint. Um, but please know that the alliance is here um, to support you. We got your back. And if there's anything that you need from us, um, we are really just a phone call away, an email away. But thank no, you so I much appreciate that. for your time. Really, really appreciate it, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Bye All bye. right. Bye. Take care. Um, up next, I'm going to turn this over to Adam Purcell and Pat Watts, um, who are going to discuss how small business um, energy efficiency investments work on the ground, um, why Main Street Efficiency Act is needed, um, and how the legislation will assist in incentivizing small businesses to participate um, in utility energy efficiency programs. So with that, Adam and Pat, I'm turning it over to you. Um, this is your, your time. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. And thank you. Uh, I want to thank, I guess, are, are we on? Yeah, so thank you, Paula. And I want to thank Congressman Welch, who's left already, for being with us today and, and really for being with us in support um, uh, all along over the last year as we've worked on the Main Street Efficiency Act. I want to step back just for a quick second as we um, as, as we move to kind of the boots on the ground side of this, uh, after talking about the, the legislative process there a bit with, with the Congressman. Uh, util the utility DSM space, we talk about that a lot, the demand side management or program space. Utilities spend as much as $8 billion a year um, helping their customers reduce their energy costs. A portion of this goes to small businesses, right? And that, you know, small businesses as defined in this Main Street Efficiency Act make up as many as 95% of all commercial customers of utilities. So the portion of the money, uh, the $8 billion that goes to those small businesses, maybe as much as $2 billion a year, it comes in the form of incentives and rebates and it's by far the hardest money to, uh, to give away. Uh, for the utilities in these programs. Um, you know, the, the, the catch, of course, is that the small business has to come up with the other portion. Like that, that incentive or rebate that we're all familiar with covers on average uh, about half the project cost. The other half of the project cost the customer has to come up with, right? And so, you know, in, in the best of economic times, pre-pandemic, um, Companies like those led by uh, our next guest, Pat Watts, uh, FCI Management, uh, and thousands of other clean energy workers toil at working with small businesses to try to get them to make what is truly the best investment that they'll ever make. And we, and we struggle to get these projects to move forward. In fact, we're way behind in, in helping this segment, the small business segment, reap the benefits of the green energy economy, green energy revolution that so many larger businesses uh, are, are reaping today. The Main Street Efficiency Act is designed to ensure that this situation uh, doesn't go from bad to worse, right? In the absence of the passage of this legislation post-pandemic, billions of dollars that utilities have already budgeted for their SMB customers risk going unspent, right? In which case, tens of thousands of clean energy jobs will go unfilled. The U.S. will backslide on decarbonization goals and more SMBs will go out of business under the weight of otherwise controllable operating costs, right? So the problem here is we have worked very hard to try to get these programs to help small businesses where they need it most. And now as we come out of the pandemic, they're less likely to participate. Now, when we began working on this legislation last year, the post-pandemic scenario that I just described, that going from bad to worse, it was supposition. It was based on a lot of a real world experience, but it was in fact supposition. Where we've gotten to now, we actually have evidence that it's the case, that it is the case that the poor participation by small businesses in programs to help them uh, lower their operating costs will be worse post pandemic. It has been worse post pandemic. In fact, the majority of Northeast utilities in order to restart their SM, their small business programs over the last six months have temporarily raised their incentives to cover 100% of the, the project cost, just to get that participation back to pre-pandemic rates. This of course is a temporary solution, but it's actually worse than a temporary solution. 
These are regulated utilities. This is regulated spending. It must meet cost effectiveness tests, which means that these extra incentive dollars are simply borrowed from another project, right? This approach does not result in helping additional small businesses participate. It doesn't create additional savings and it doesn't create additional clean energy jobs. What does do that elegantly is the Main Street Efficiency Act, a direct investment by the federal government in the engine of the US economy, small businesses, an investment which gets matching private funding dollar for dollar, an investment that leverages an existing ecosystem of not only US-based, but local-based product and service providers, and which gets the benefit of a mature and robust evaluation, measurement, and verification infrastructure, which screens and post audits all of this investment for cost effectiveness. It's doing that today for the dollar from the utility, and it will cover that for the dollar from the federal government. Lastly, something else that the Main Street Efficiency Act will do is to provide benefits to underserved communities. All small businesses are underserved by definition uh, and small business EE programs have traditionally been able to target lower income communities, both urban and rural. By reducing or eliminating the customer's financial obligation, the Main Street Efficiency Program will increase our ability to help the neediest businesses, those that are most at risk of shutting down including in communities of color and in those communities which have historically been impacted negatively by our energy infrastructure. With that, I would like to introduce a friend of mine, a friend of the industry, Pat Watts, founder and CEO of FCI Management. Um, Pat is well known for the work that she's done uh, helping utilities to help their customers uh, become more energy efficient all over California, in places like New York and Atlanta. And um, Pat's work in the community extends well beyond uh, what FCI management does to help small businesses uh, and residential customers. She's been very involved in the community through working with nonprofit organizations um, uh, across the Southern California area uh, in communities that I've worked. So I know I've seen her out there and, and I'm, I'm happy with the work that she's done. She cares a lot about the people who work for her. She's been very involved in training people for, for clean energy jobs and creating an awful lot of jobs um, through that through her company and its ecosystem. So with that, Pat, I'd like you to uh, give us some introductory remarks, give us your thoughts on the Main Street Efficiency Act, state of the industry, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into some questions and answers. Great, thank you so much, Adam. And first of all, I would really like to applaud uh, Congressman Welch, Paula Glover, and the Alliance to Save Energy for their leadership in the Main Street Efficiency Act. We have needed more to support our small business community because I've long known that small businesses don't prioritize energy efficiency. That's not their thing. It's not what they're really interested in. They are interested in profitability, serving their customers, and in most cases, small businesses don't have access to a lot of capital. So their day-to-day -day is just making sure my company is running right, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a barbershop, whether it's a nail salon or what have you. They struggle every day just to, with cash flows, bottom line issues, and energy efficiency is not their priority. And so in working in program design and implementation with utility companies over 20 years now, we've known that small businesses need a little help and being able to have an opportunity to not only invest, I mean, let's just use investment as a, 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 a content of the fact that utility companies do provide energy efficiency programs that help small businesses have an opportunity to participate. But as Adam alluded to and has been alluded to many times over the years, these programs have changed and utility companies require um, cost effectiveness tests that don't necessarily always provide the opportunity for the small businesses to participate in these programs at low cost or no cost. So why is this important? Because small businesses, as, as Representative Welch said, represent 95% of utility customers. Small businesses, it's always been known, are the backbone of this country. Small businesses have been very impacted 
over the last two years with the pandemic, with, you know, they were probably the most impacted business sector uh, throughout, throughout the United States because many of them had to close their restaurants and their nail shops and their small gyms. And that meant no revenue for them. So when it comes back to getting back into the economic engine of growing these businesses and helping these businesses survive, they're really just looking at how can I serve my customer? How can I make my capital, you know, get us enough money that we need to pay our employees? And how can we recover from the devastation of last year? So the utility programs that are in existence now have done a great job, in my opinion, in serving that community, but it's not enough. Now we're asking customers for their participation, co-payments into the investment in their company. And look, let's face it, we've looked at some measures like lighting, which have been fairly easy to um, get customers to implement. But when it talks about energy, when you talk about energy efficiency, you have to go a lot deeper. And a lot deeper than just lighting. You have to start looking at things that really cost, what really draw energy consumption, that's air conditioning, uh, HVAC systems, water heating. You know, those things um, are really the drivers in the cost of energy consumption in this, in this, in this nation. I believe that small businesses would happily be more willing to uh, participate in these programs if there were opportunities for them to receive the grants like being proposed in this Main Street Efficiency Act, they would be more willing to get involved and, and invest in, in these um, opportunities. Let me say this and just stepping back just a little bit. Small businesses in most cases don't own the commercial buildings that they're in. They're renters. And to that extent, investing in someone else's property is definitely not going to rise to the top. But they're also concerned about their bottom line. So how do we help these, these small businesses to achieve both reduction of their expenses and their costs, but not being so concerned that they're putting their money in somebody else's property? And that's where incentives and rebates have helped in the past. But again, as we go into asking the customer to, to um, help to pay for some of the cost of this, you're going to get more and more resistance of small businesses in doing so. So we have to focus on other opportunities to leverage, to leverage the utility incentives, rebates, their programs that they're offering and focusing on small businesses with federal grants that will incentivize small businesses to participate in this program. In our company, when we're out implementing programs for small business customers, we walk out on the streets, we knock on their doors and we go into their business and we talk to them. And we ask them what their priorities are and what their concerns are. So I know, you know, from a lot of experience <laughs> that their concerns are really just surviving and being profitable in their company, being able to pay livable wages for their employees. All of these are a big concern, being able to provide health care and, you know, appropriate benefits for those customers, all things which cost and take away from their bottom line. They want to provide good customer service. They want to create a, a way where the customers are continually coming back to them. But they don't have the resources that large companies have. They're not publicly traded. They don't have the access to capital. They're not getting private equity. They are small mom and top, pop type stores that employ people across this company in greater numbers than some of our largest industries. So I think the focus here on focusing on small businesses in particular and small businesses, especially in disadvantaged communities and ethnic communities, which are oftentimes struggling just because of the community that they serve. And so we have to make sure that everyone has access. Everyone can embrace the technologies and energy efficiency and let's take that even one step further. Let's talk about the need for greenhouse gas emissions and decarbonization. When we talk about that, we're really talking about new technologies and we're talking about huge investments here. The technologies 
are surely coming out, you know, faster and more cutting edge, but of course they're expensive. And so the only way that small businesses are going to be able to take advantage of being able to have these technologies in their facilities is with some assistance from utility companies, from their local governments, from their state governments, and from the federal government. So this, this, this Main Street Energy Efficiency Act is something we should all be waving the banner for because we're really focusing on helping small businesses to thrive and to grow. And when they thrive and they grow, this country grows because they're hiring people every day in numbers that we can only hope continue to help drive our economic future. So with that, Adam, with kind of my opening remarks, we're gonna talk about something specific. Great, great. And with that, I would invite our, um, uh, all attendees to uh, type their questions again into the, into the question box and we will get to those. Um, I will start with uh, building off of a, maybe a couple of things that, that you mentioned. You know, I, I, I can't uh, imagine a piece of legislation that's more on the, on the face of it pro-business uh, than this, right? We're talking about um, of something that has the sign-on and support of, of some of the largest utilities in the country, right? So they want to spend money helping their, their customers save money. Like you, Pat, I've been out there walking up and down the street talking to these small business customers, and I know they're always confused. Why would the utility pay me to use less of their of their product? But I think most of the folks on, on this call get that. But the, the truth is um, utilities are going to increasingly struggle to deploy the funds that they budgeted to get particularly small businesses to invest, as you said, in the next measure beyond lighting, more complex measures. And it's really where we are, it's where we find ourselves. Um, so I, I wonder if, if I could borrow on your experience, which I failed to mention in your introduction uh, of working at Southern California Edison, right? So you were on the utility side before you founded FCI. Uh, so borrowing on that experience, could you talk just a little bit about the challenges that are almost regardless of the pandemic, just at the moment we're facing, the challenges that your, your colleagues uh, on the utility side are facing in trying to get adoption of technologies that frankly just cost more per kilowatt hour saved, right? So they're, they're needing to pay more in incentives, but they're doing it, you know, they're trying to just step it up a little at a time and we're not seeing the adoption of these technologies and how Main Street efficiency could, could help with that. If you just elaborate, maybe on that, from again, the perspective of the utility. Sure. Well, we know that investor-owned utilities are regulated. And so in this regulation, they don't, you know, put together these programs in a vacuum. They go through a very stringent, arduous process of developing the programs, seeking the funds from their regulatory agency. And I mean, they really have to get down to the very details. When we're talking about how many kilowatts, how many kilowatt hours are being saved, what goals are, what your budget are, budgets are for these goals, but in particular, most of them get to the point where they're looking for cost effectiveness. Because in many times the utility companies are actually using ratepayer dollars to fund these programs. And there has to be proper justification for that. There has to be a return on the investment for utility companies as well as the customer, if you will, for investing in creating energy efficiency programs that actually reduce what their product is, which is energy. So they're reducing you know, the, the sale of their products, but for a better reason and a better purpose. Because as we grow as a society, we're using more energy for all of the fancy devices that we have. Everything is plugged in now. And so we're consuming more energy. So we have to be smart because if we're getting away and as we get away from fossil fuels, from coal, from natural gas, um, we find that looking at alternative methods of um, alternative energy resources, wind, solar, and those things are not enough to make up for the demand in energy that customers across the nation are focusing on. So the process, I think, Adam, really to answer your question, is very, very 
you know, strenuous to make sure that for the utility and its rate payers, it's really cost effective. Now, when it comes to those rate payers who are also small businesses, it can be somewhat disproportionate to the larger businesses in terms of the amount of energy saved and also the amount of investment that larger businesses are willing to make as opposed to what smaller businesses can even afford to make. Yeah, and it, something else that I thought of while you said that, the, the, um, I think what's, what's nice about the Main Street Efficiency Act is the, fact, is the fact that it takes advantage of an existing ecosystem to fl flow the money from the federal government. Now, contrasting that to something that we were very happy to have a decade ago in the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grants, um, and, and we will most certainly have those again this time, uh, but they can be cumbersome, right? And they can be parallel. And so the idea in, a, in an express efficiency program for small businesses through a utility to try to take a grant that comes from elsewhere, a community grant, a state energy office grant, a local government grant, and kind of mix the funds becomes very complex. And so I wonder if, if, uh, if you have the same sense that I do, that what is really valuable about it, express efficiency small business programs is the simplicity of participation, right? The ease of participation. I, it, of course, a higher incentive helps makes these projects go, but it's in fact the ease of participation. So I, what people need to remember about Main Street efficiency is that while these are grants to utilities, the, the money is for the small business, right? The, the utilities are not able to take this money and use it in lieu of investing their own money and get credit for it, right? They'll still invest their money. They won't change their incentive design. And so it's a very, very, it's the, perhaps the easiest way for the federal government to get money for this purpose to small businesses, right? Easier than, for example, the, the payroll protection program, which did pay for utility costs for small businesses throughout the pandemic and was very cumbersome and had, had opportunities for, for businesses that weren't really small businesses uh, to participate. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that in terms of the businesses that, that you deal with uh, in these programs and how important it is for them that they just kind of sign on the dotted line and everything gets specified and built and the van shows up next week. And before they know it, that you know the new equipment is in place and running, they don't have to manage that project while they manage their business. So what I can tell you is when you walk into a customer's facility and you offer them an opportunity for an energy efficient retrofit or energy efficient upgrade. And the bottom line is you're gonna save money. They are open and embracing of come on in, let's talk, show me what you have to offer. Because they understand that the importance, and maybe it's their priority is just their bottom line, but they also, in, 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 they also embrace the idea that they are also participating in creating you know, reduction in greenhouse gases. So it's really twofold. Um, small business customers don't slam the door in your face if you're offering them some help to save them money. That's just the truth, right? I mean, a lot of times it's about timing and there's a lot of you know, added benefit to energy efficiency. Let me just give you one example. And I'm sure this is familiar to most people on this call today. But in the lighting world, we've kind of gone from the old 100 watt incandescent light bulb to the fluorescent bulb to the LEDs. But when you walk into a customer, let's say a convenience store, and they got some fluorescent lamps in there and they're flickering and they're kind of dim, and you tell them, you know what, we're going to not only save you energy, but we're going to improve the, your, your aesthetics. We're going to brighten up your store. We're going to look at, make it look better, make it look safer for your customer. They're all ears. That's what they want to hear. They want to hear that not only are we just saving energy and saving money, but we're doing something to enhance our business as well. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a 360 degree opportunity here. And in order to really get more and more customers to participate, because I can tell you that even in the programs that I, we have uh, implemented that were no cost to the customer, you never get 100% participation. It's still somewhere up around 50% at best. Well, there's some customers that are either non-believing or don't want it or are kind of picky about uh, what you're putting in their facility uh, at the end of the day. But we need to educate customers. We need to make them more aware 
of what the programs and the program benefits are. And I think that you'll find even more and more customers um, embracing you know, these programs and new technologies. Very good. We have a question from Nancy Seidman, uh, which I think is great. And, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear your, you elaborate on some thoughts on this. Uh, Nancy asks, could you talk about what you found successful in recruiting and training a diverse EE workforce, including internships, apprenticeships, community college tech training? You know, and so from my thinking, Pat, the experience that you've had in Southern California in particular with working with um, community-based organizations and, you know, who are the folks that, that wind up getting these jobs at FCI or at the people you buy uh, the equipment from or the people that walk the street and do the energy audit? Can you talk a little bit about that and how maybe, you know, how when we expand these programs through the Main Street Efficiency Act, we'll naturally we'll be able to expand those opportunities. Sure. Well, you know, we were very fortunate in our very first contract that we had with Southern California Edison to propose a sort of a community-based organization mentor-protege program, which would allow us, and we implemented our program to work with local community-based organizations to identify individuals in their community who want to be trained to be back office support, energy efficient auditors or specialists uh, or assessors uh, and or installers of technology. So we had an opportunity for, for 16 years to work with these um, community-based organizations and train these individuals in a six to eight month training program. And then once they completed that program, many of them were hired you know, by our company. So that really helped to develop our workforce. Uh, many of them were hired by other third-party companies that implement these programs. And many of them actually were even hired with the utility companies. So one of the things that we know that when we talk about energy efficiency as a whole or as a discipline in school, we need, there's really not a lot of curriculum or courses, you know, in the junior colleges or, or colleges that focus on this area in particular. But as you start to work with trade um, institutions, educational institutions that started to embrace the fact that, hey, we need to teach people how to do weatherization. Um, and hey, we need people that are lighting installers and we need to teach them basic electricity and help them get the fundamentals for being able to go out there and install and start to develop this workforce. So in speaking about workforce, Adam, as you know, uh, Will Dan has a great training program that they have been doing uh, in the New York area and expanding across the country. And they have worked with the California Conservation Corps. And I happened to talk to uh, Antoine Cannon at Will Down, who runs that program. He's a longtime friend of mine as well about that because we were looking for folks to fill positions here in California. The Conservation Corps in California does an amazing job training uh, individuals for energy efficient jobs. And for every aspect of that job, again, training them how to be auditors, how to go out and do lighting assessments and assess HVAC units for efficiency, teach, teaching, teaching them how to be installers, you know, what the techniques are, what the requirements are. It goes from classroom uh, to real life, you know, actually on the job training. And so we need more of that across the, the, the United States in developing this workforce because it is expanding by leaps and bounds. Yeah, and I can say also that, you know, from, Will, from the Wildam perspective, we do a lot with the um, LA DWP, Municipal Utility, where they, they, you know, they value not only the success of the efficiency program, but job creation in the city. So they tend to pay more for us to be able to do things like uh, tra those training programs. Um, the reason IOUs do less of it is because they're trying to hit the bottom line, right? So in the end, money, which the Main Street Efficiency Act would put towards these programs, will make it easier to do the types of things that Antoine is doing that you've done in Southern California. Um, it's, you know, it, it just is the reality that companies like FCI or Wildan in the end have, have, are trying to make money doing these programs. And if we're constantly slashing our margins to cut the amount of the customer copay to get the project to sell so we can hit the goal, then we have less money with which to do these things. It's just the reality of it. It's true. And so the, the federal money supporting this important industry at this important time uh, will we'll only allow you know, more, of that, more of that training to take place. There is another question that's been typed in 
Um, does the act contain provisions designed to leverage and extend the reach of the grant dollars, for example, to support um, inclusive tariff on bill financing, um, investments tied to the meter, which help us get over the renter's dilemma. So yes, I'm, what I would say about that is there are, um, there's no, the legislation is written in a way that remains completely open for the utility to design the program any way they want. So there would be no reason that they couldn't uh, include an, an on-bill tariff program or any kind of financing program um, um, to, uh, and other measures. You know, uh, before we talked a little bit about um, electrification, there's a, there is a kind of a set aside in this for 25% electrification, electric vehicle chargers, battery storage. So uh, the, the legislation is written in a way that this money is to support the customer's participation in whatever program the utility wants to run. And they can change this design going forward and they will be submitting under a set of rules that are written by DOE um, and you know, bright ideas about how they can help their customers are going to be reviewed and favored uh, by DOE in, in giving these grants out. So with that, we're up against time. Paul, uh, Pat, I wanna thank you first for, your, for jumping in the last minute on this. And it was a really great discussion um, and Paul, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Pat, for really a great um, discussion. Really appreciate all of your time. And quite frankly, Adam, your, your leadership on this issue um, and Pat, your leadership of working on energy efficiency with small businesses for the at least the 20 years that I've known you, if not longer. So we really do appreciate your leadership. Um, for all of you who have joined us, thank you for joining us for our policy perspective. We really are hoping and we are planning that we will do more of these. Um, and you know, a big thank you to Congressman Peter Welch for his leadership with the Main Street Efficiency Act. Um, you heard some suggestions of things that we can do. So um, if you're interested and engaged, please reach out to your local legislator, let them know that this is important to you and why, um, and encourage them strongly um, to support Main Street. As the Congressman said, um, when you hear from a constituent, it's just different. Um, our, our leaders hear that differently. So I encourage all of you to do that. Um, and of course, if you have suggestions and ideas, there were a couple that came through the chat that I'll respond to directly or members of my team will, please feel free to reach out. So with that, it's 11 a.m. here on the East Coast and 8 a.m. for Ms. Pat on the West Coast. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful day um, and look forward to connecting with you in the future, hopefully even in person. Great. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.